Good morning, Vessel Collective Church, and everybody watching at home on Church Online. How y'all doing this morning? It's good to see everybody. Glad you're here. Glad you're there at home watching. So um, we're so glad to be here again for our second weekend in live church, and um, it's a real blessing. Um, we're super excited. We have uh, a couple of things today. We're going to be announcing some new leaders, interns and we're gonna be praying over them. Joe Ho is gonna be teaching for us here this week and next, and has, some, um, has a really great message for us. So um, I only have one announcement. We are starting a men's pancake breakfast um, the fourth Saturday of each month this summer on Saturday morning from seven to nine, and it'll be down in the boardroom. If you have questions, there'll be some stuff on the website. Uh, there'll be uh, you can talk to Trevor or Jake or a couple of different people, and uh, we would love to see you join us for that. So we're so glad you're joining us. Uh, let's stand and let's get into worship.
presence. Your presence is in open door. We want you, Lord, like never before. Your presence is in open door. Come now, Lord, like never before. Amen. This next song just says that Jesus is our strength. about y'all, but I need some strength. You are my strength. You are my strength.
are my hope. You are my hope. Hope like no other. Come on, church. Hope like no other. Reaches to me. One more time, you are my strength. You are my strength. Strength like no other. Strength like. Strength like no other. You reach us, God. Reach us to me. Reach us to me. Reach us to me. Reach us. Amen. Church, we are very excited this morning. We have two young people that are flourishing right in front of us. That's been our word this year at Vessel Flourish. And we are very excited. We're going to introduce our new summer intern leaders to you here this morning. Uh, Shay's going to start, and then I'm going to finish, and we're going to pray over them. So take it away. So... Um, this morning, we are going to just talk up and highlight two people that are joining our team that are, um, oh, so sorry. You may have a seat for a moment. <laughs> you know, I'm standing, so I just didn't think about that. So sorry. Um, but uh, I'd like to bring one more person up here. So Faith, come on up. This is Faith, and she has already been serving our church with student ministry, but she is joining us this morning um, just in a deeper capacity. She is going to be our student ministry intern, specifically just pouring into the girls, and um, she's already been doing that role as their small group leader, so this is exciting for her to just have an opportunity to pour deeper into the lives of these girls this summer. And she is invested in this ministry, and she's invested in our church, and she already has a great relationship with these girls. So we were just really excited and thrilled that she was willing to come on board and take this opportunity to serve in a deeper capacity with us this summer. And so if you don't have, um, if you've not met Faith, if you have not introduced yourself, please do make her feel even more welcome um, I know that she knows many of you because you have students in the ministry, but just get a chance, introduce yourself so that she continues to get to know the lovely people that we have here. And um, in just a minute, we're going to pray over her, but there's one more person that we need to add in recognizing this morning, Mr. Gary. Yes. So um, many of you may know that uh, we're going through, as we're coming back to church, some changes and I personally am, so I'm moving but staying in the area. Our friends, the Jacobsons, are coming home from London, and I'm renting their house right now. So in addition to that and some other things, I'm going to take some time away this summer, and um, we want to in introduce somebody who has stepped into um, leading worship and into an internship this summer, and it's Miss Jessica Wright. Yeah. And um, we were at rehearsal the other night, and... Jessica looked at me um, probably like somebody looks at their dad and says, please do not embarrass me on <laughs> Sunday. And, um, and I probably could because I met Jessica back in 2013 at uh, ACF Northeast, and I was serving with her and her brother, Shedrick, um, back then at that campus. But, uh, and many of you have gotten to know Jessica here, but I can only tell you, I could tell you a lot of stories, but when we talk about flourishing and watching somebody grow, um, it, she exemplifies it, and so this isn't something that is recent. Jake and I started talking to her, boy, back in probably December, November, you know, January, um, and through COVID and church at home, um, she's been a rock, and she's been um, faithful, uh, reliable, and dependable, but beyond that, she's been a great friend and um, is just invested in our core values here at Vessel. Authenticity, humility, generosity, and unity. And we couldn't think of anybody better uh, who has surrendered to the Lord and loves worship and loves people 
uh, to lead us this summer than Jessica. So I'm very excited about this and everything that God's going to do here this summer. And um, uh, Jake joked, I think, uh, the week, last week or the week before about Gary and the girls. And I'm just trying not to get emotional this morning because we've served a lot during uh, COVID with Church at Home. Um, but it's been very special and sweet. So I know that all of you will come alongside of Jessica. Please pray for her and please, uh, you know, welcome her and give her a, a note of encouragement and just keep praying for her and the worship team. So we're very grateful. Shay, uh, normally we would have you come up and we'd lay hands on, but we're in this new situation. So if you want to extend your hand out, uh, that would be great. And I would ask uh, Shay to just pray for Faith and Jessica, and then we're going to close with a song, and Joe's going to come up. Bow with me. Dear Heavenly Father, um, God, we are in this room submitted to you and just in awe of your glory and your presence and the hope that you bring. And um, part of that hope for our church and for our body are these two people that are joining us up here. God, I just I thank you for their willingness and their heart for you to, to serve you and to serve your people, God. And so, um, Lord, I just I ask that your Holy Spirit just continue to guide them in the roles that they're doing. Lord, thank you for faith that she has a love and a desire to get to know young people. I pray this summer is really inspiring, um, that it challenges her, but in a good way to, to get to know you better as she leads these girls. God, I just, I pray that this is a sweet summer that she looks back on and thinks of wonderful memories of moments that she was able to do your work and see your work at hand. Um, and so, God, I just pray that you fuel faith and that you give her a continued heart to just lead well these girls who are entrusted into her uh, care and into her leadership and we just thank you for her saying yes and her willingness to say yes to that and lord i just thank you for jessica um, she's already been on our serving team in worship and she's getting to step into a higher and deeper role and lord i'm excited for what you're going to do through that in her because you are obviously doing a great work in her in this role um, as a musician and as a worship leader. And so I'm excited that we all get to play a part of her story in exploring what you have for her next, Lord. And so um, I just I pray that you continue to speak to her and speak through her, guide her in this role, help her to not see um, any challenges or problems or situations as negative but as positive things that are helping her grow and to just become whatever you have in store for her life Lord and I just I thank you for her once again and God I just ask that you continue to be with, with us this morning as we worship Lord and as we lift you up and for the wonderful message that we're going to hear God we we serve you and we we love you and it's in your name we pray amen If y'all want to stand, you're welcome to. We're going to sing kind of a new song. You've probably heard it if you listen to Christian radio or Spotify, um, but we've never sang it here. So join us. Whoa. 
capable of making a way when we don't see how you know you are in control of it all you see the past you see the present you see the future you know where we're going God and I just pray that you all impart on us hope hope for that future God and faith that we just need to trust in you I've just been struck by that in these times where I don't know what to do. I don't know how to respond. I don't even know how to feel sometimes, God. But I know that you do. You, you've got it. And I just need to trust in you. So I just pray this morning that you give us ears to hear you, that you help us to Remember to lean into you because you are the way maker and you are our anchor. And we can trust you because you love us and because you are in control. God, thank you for this morning. It's in your precious name. Amen. Thank you, worship team, and thank you, Logan, for bringing up this, the table for me. Ever since the first time I uh, took this table uh, up and I broke it, Jake won't let anybody else, uh, won't let me carry the table. Someone else always brings it up for me. <laughs> so Jake is, uh, when Jake asked me to, uh, to speak and to be able to address what's been going on in our nation uh, lately, you know, I, I felt the, the responsibility of that. Uh, you know, if you'd asked me a month ago, I, I, would be, I would have said, I'm sure that the news is going to be about COVID-19 like all the way until it's over. Like there's no way anything else is going to make it to the top of the headlines. And that's not the way that it's been the last couple weeks. It's been, it's been something else. Um, and, uh, and when Jake asked me to speak on this, I, I've been, I was praying and reflecting over this week and I decided to speak about uh, racial justice. Uh, and, and what the Bible has to say about that. And I know that that's provocative because um, I, I think that a lot of times um, when you get into churches uh, you, and even when you go to some of these uh, the Christian gatherings, one of the main things we pray for is, is for unity. And unity is, is right. It's a right thing to pray for. As a matter of fact, I, I wanted to speak about unity. It would be a very easy for me to speak about unity. I've got a lot of talks about unity, a lot of talks about racial unity and things like that, and eth ethnic unity, uh, and, and that's, that's, uh, that would be easier in my wheelhouse. But the reason why I made a different choice is this. Um, if you'd picture with me, so this is my lovely family. It's Tracy and my wife over there. Imagine if Tracy were to come to me one day and say, there's a problem, and I'm really hurt, and I'm really upset. And the first thing out of my mouth would be, you know what we need here is a little more unity. How do you think that would go over? <laughs> I, I, I think it would, it would probably be right. But it might also be saying that I'm not really convinced that what you think is a problem is actually a problem. That also might, it might come across that way. Or it might be me saying, um, your being upset is a, more of a problem to me than whatever problem is you're about to tell me, right? It could happen. So what we've been hearing about 
in the, the protests that are going on all over the country, really all over the world, is a cry for racial justice to say something is wrong here. And I don't know where each of us is with that, like what we've thought about it, how much we thought about it before, what our opinions are, but that's, that's what that's about. And I did want to come at and address what it's, been a, what it's about uh, from the perspective of the Bible. Um, but before that, I'd, I'd just like to give you a little journey. I, I'm going to tell you sort of, uh, if you will, where I am and what I think, not because I, I want you to believe the same thing I believe, but just to let you know, because everyone's probably going to wonder and try and infer, so I'll just tell you what I think. Um, I, I uh, grew up, it, usually from, from a child, a ch- early childhood on, whenever I was at school, I was the only Chinese kid in, in most environments I was in. I was an English language learner when I first started preschool, um, and I did encounter what most people call prejudice. It's kids, it's mostly just kids making fun of each other as they do, so that's racial prejudice, um, and that's not nice. It's also, ju- it's also, in most cases, kids not being nice to each other. I had some occasion to experience what I would say maybe is closer to what you would call injustice when when teachers, when teachers would say things that would, be, uh, that would be insulting or racially insensitive, I think that's a bigger deal. Um, but I really had my first uh, exposure to larger scale racial injustice when I was a preteen and I heard the story of Vincent Chin. I don't know how you follow the news back then, it was in the early 80s, and he was a Chinese American guy in Detroit. And he got into an argument with some people in a bar because the people in the bar um, really resented. Uh, resented the, the fact that they were having economic troubles. And at that point, Detroit was having, uh, was, there was an economic depression in Detroit, and they were angry at Toyota and Honda imports at that time, which they blamed for the, their economic problems. And so they got this argument with Vincent Chin, who, uh, because they thought he was Japanese. Um, he left, and they followed him with a baseball bat and beat him with a baseball bat until he was dead. Uh, he was, uh, they were tried. There was no disputing that fact that they killed him. And the sentence was a $3,000 fine. And that really got my attention because I thought, whoa, 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 $3,000 fine. And it was the first time I had this experience for me as a Chinese American of something that, there's something that's not fair about that. And of course, it got my attention because by and large, my experience and assumption was that things were mostly fair out there. Um, as I went into ministry with InterVarsity Christian Fellowship and been doing college campus ministry the last 26 years, we have uh, frequent and frank conversations about race, ethnicity, and culture in InterVarsity. And so we get to hear what we, we, we think. And so I, I, I began to have my eyes open to my black colleagues and realizing it, like, it's, it happens to everybody. Like virtually everybody has a personal or immediate family story. And I thought, whoa, that, like I, I didn't, like either people didn't tell me, but like it wasn't happening in my family or any of my good friends at my Chinese church. Like that wasn't the normal thing that was happening in those days. Um, so uh, uh, when I was a, uh, uh, for about four years, I was the national director for our Asian American ministries. And I had a peer, you know, on my team who was the national director of Black Campus Ministries. And during those four years, I had two, two different peers during that, uh, that time. And two out of two, they told like really jarring stories. One of them, his, uh, his wife, a number of years back, they were stopped in their car. Um, his wife was taken out of the car, put face down at gunpoint, um, and, uh, because she fit the description of someone who had stolen the car. Now, it turns out the car description was not like their car didn't fit the description of the car, and um, the person, like, the person was a black female, but other than that, the person was twice her size. So she was like a hundred foot petite woman, and this person was much larger. So she, the only part of the description that she fit was black female, and including the car itself. And so I thought, that's, wow, that's shocking. And then a few years back, the other person, she was uh, the other Black Campus Ministries director, she was much younger, and this is, which is much more recent, just a few years ago. She was a 30-year-old woman, and uh, living in the sort of uh, pretty normal neighborhood in uh, Durham, North Carolina, was asked by her neighbors to water their plants. And so she was over in their yard watering their plants, and t- when she heard sirens and lights pull up, police run out of the car with guns drawn pointed at her because somehow someone had seen the watering can, I guess, and had, had reported a person with a gun because the watering can looked like a gun. Now, both of those were, on, from one perspective, were honest mistakes. 
But if honest mistakes happen over and over and over again, and like I said, everybody that I talk to, them or their immediate family, an honest mistake has happened. And it's like, it's just never happened to me, right? So it's easy for me to believe just honest mistake if it's never happened to me. But if it happens to everybody that I know. So, so just to keep, I'm giving you the, I'm giving you my journey of how I've come to believe that, hey, something is a problem. And I'm not an expert about policy or you know, uh, like all the stuff that people know know a lot more about than me, but I'm pretty convinced that something's not right somewhere in there. And so that's where I've come from. Um, Today we're going to be looking at a passage of Scripture where a complaint about injustice arose. And so you don't have to, to... be where I am. You don't have to agree with anything I said before till now, but what I'd love to do from after this is take us into a passage of Scripture where somebody came up, a a group of people came up and said, hey, this is unjust, this is wrong, and and we're complaining about it, much in the way that we're seeing on the the screen, and to see what the the early church uh, did about it. So will you pray pray with me? Lord God, we thank you for this day to be able to gather as your people, and we acknowledge that uh, for many of us, this has been a, a, a hard week for one reason or another. Um, some of us have had struggles with our jobs, struggles with our kids, struggles with our finances. Some of us are fine with the way that COVID is leaving us, and some of, for some of us, that's really hard. Um, and we come before you and bring that to you. We also acknowledge that in our, our state and in our country, uh, there's a lot of pain from COVID, but also underneath the surface, we're We are seeing a lot of pain over racial injustice, and we as the church want to be able to press deeper in that. We don't always know what to do, and so we ask for your wisdom from your word. Lord, would we gain a little bit today from listening to your word, and would you help us to take one step uh, in being able to look to you so that we would respond um, in your way according to your scriptures. In Jesus' name, amen. So um, in the last number of weeks, Jake has been preaching a series called The First Days from Acts, and that's the the beginning of the early church. And the passage that we're looking at uh, today is also from Acts. It's from the first days of the church. It's from Acts chapter 6, starting in verse 1 and going through verse 7. Um, You can turn in your Bibles if you wish with that. We should also have it up on the screen with a slide. Um, And I'll begin with me in Acts 6.1. In those days... When the number of disciples were increasing, the Hellenistic Jews amongst them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. We're going to need to sit on this verse a little bit to get the picture, right? Because if you just read this, you might, it might not be obvious what's happening. So let's start with the daily distribution of food. If you remember Jake teaching through Acts at a couple different points, he talked about how generous the church was and how people uh, gave of what they had to be able to meet each other's needs. And that was the daily distribution of food. It looks like that, people, uh, that there was a regular uh, distribution of food from people who had to people who needed, and that was going on. But there was a complaint, and there was a complaint of unfairness. Uh, and the complaint was raised by the Hellenistic Jews. So there's a group called the Hellenistic Jews who said, wait, 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 it's unfair. Our widows are being overlooked. And they complained against the Hebraic Jews. So the next thing we need to do is to figure out who these two groups of people are. So the people that are complaining, Hellenistic Jews, that is a, uh, uh, that is a way of describing um, Greek-speaking Jews or really any Jews that were from outside of Palestine. So you had the Jews that lived in Galilee and Judea like Jesus, those were the, those, and those were the Hebraic Jews, the, the Jews that spoke Hebrew or Aramaic. They were the in-town people, if you will, and the Hellenistic Jews would be the immigrants, if you will. The, uh, the Hebraic Jews, all of Jesus' disciples were Hebraic Jews. Jesus didn't really leave Galilee, Samaria, and Judea in his life. So he, his, his three-year ministry was all in there. All his disciples were pretty much from there. Um, and, uh, and, and the, the, the first 120 disciples that were praying in the upper room at the very beginning of Acts, they were virtually all Hebraic Jews. All 12 disciples were Hebraic Jews. You know, they're people from the area. Now, Pente- the day of Pentecost, um, for those of you who are familiar with the story, when the church began and, and uh, thousands of people were added into the church on the day of Pentecost, the day of Pentecost was a, was a, uh, it was a feast that people traveled from all over 
to come to that feast. And so during Pentecost, when, when uh, Peter preached to the crowd and thousands of people came to, uh, came to the Lord, most of them actually were not people that were from Jerusalem. They were actually people from far away lands that came there to celebrate the feast. And so if you can imagine, a whole bunch of people become followers of Jesus, and then a lot of them are from out of town. They're he- Hellenistic Jews. They're, they're immig- they, they, become, they change from visit- visitors to immigrants because they stay. And why do they stay? Because they became Christians, and there aren't Christians anywhere else, right? They join the church, and the only church that exists is the one that's in Jerusalem, so they all just stay in Jerusalem. Right, so, so, here's the, so here's the picture. All those out-of-towners, right, these, these, the, the immigrant Jews that join the church are saying, hey, all of you national Jews that are from around here, you're not treating us fairly because when you're giving food out to the poor, you're skipping over us. Does everyone get that picture? So the complaint comes up. Now before we go on to see what the, uh, the, the uh, disciples do about it, let me tell you what happens to me usually if someone comes up and complains to me that, you know, let's, I, I'm, in tra- I'm often in charge of larger type things in my current, currently in my job right now. So if someone complains and says, this is unfair, I go through this kind of thought process. Are you right? Is it actually unfair? Let me look back at, uh, let me look back at it. Let me look closer. Maybe you just think it's unfair, but it's not really unfair. Or maybe it seems unfair to you, but if you understood that maybe it's not unfair. Or, and if I find out that maybe it's unfair, I start asking, well, was it intentionally unfair? Did someone do something wrong intentionally? Or was it just ac- an accidental unfairness, a coincidence that it ended up being unfair, right? Coincidental. Um, sometimes I ask, well, what were you doing? Like, wh- how much of it was somebody else's fault and how much of it was your fault, like by something you did or didn't do? All those questions are fine questions to ask. But I want you to notice what the, uh, the disciples ask. So next slide. So Acts 6, chapters uh, 2 through 4. We may have some technical difficulties, so... Let me read this to you. So the twelve gathered all the disciples and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. A couple times I want you to mention that twice in here the word of God is mentioned. It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the Word of God. And in the very end, it says, we will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. So instead of asking like, hey, was this real or imagined? Was it on purpose or was it it accidental? How much was your fault? How much is it someone else's fault? They immediately started wondering, how will this injustice or this raised, uh, uh, the fact that we've raised a complaint about injustice, how will it affect the spread of God's word? They, They immediately felt like, you know what? This problem that has come up, that has been brought to our attention, it is a threat to the spread of God's word. It could be something that takes us, it could be something that could, could, uh, take us off track. It could be something that could undermine the witness of the church and the spread of God's word. So um, I want to tell you that as someone who works with young people and people from various cultures in, in, in the U.S., that the younger you get, the bigger the problem is with the spreading of God's word, the bigger the problem injustice is to sp- the spreading of God's word. That amongst young people today, uh, so um, if you look at a, at a college campus these days, they did a survey a couple years back about college students and asked, how likely are you to go to a protest? I think it's 2017. They act, actually asked about it, and that the, in 2017, the freshman class was more likely to go to a protest than any freshman class on record. So, including like back in the 60s, where your your pictures of our protests were everywhere. So, the consciousness of of justice being an important thing is just getting larger and larger. Um, and if if uh, and and if the church doesn't address that, we'll we will be we, we will not be talking about the things that are on the minds and hearts. Of young people. But more than that, for young black Americans these days, I've heard so many things, of, uh, so many ways in which this, this, uh, this blatant uh, racial injustice, and again, that's my read, 
<laughs> a blatant ma- a racial injustice, is undermining faith itself. I talked to a really strong minister the other day, someone whose faith is about as strong as anyone I've ever, I've, I ever, I've ever known, and said, that said, um, I was really mad at God this morning. I woke up and said, God, why won't you do anything about this? I'm not, even, I'm not even so much mad at the people out there. I'm mad at God because I said, God, you made me black. I didn't have a choice about it. Why does this keep happening and why won't you do anything about it? Now, being a person in ministry, she prayed her way out of it, got up and went to work. But there are some people maybe that don't have as deep roots with the Lord. I, I heard the story recently from one of my, uh, my friends about someone in his church um, recently, a woman that s- said, I'm actually having trouble praying at all. And this was an older, an older woman, um, not elderly, but sort of not a, not a young kid, but a, a sort of an, an adult woman and said, you know, this is, I'm just having trouble praying. I, I don't know how to have faith during this time. And then I heard another story of a younger, younger person um, that, that was more like the teenager type age that said, I've had it with this Christian thing. This doesn't do any good. This stuff doesn't do any good in the face of the problems that I have and is walking away from faith. So I tell you that the, the lack of justice in this world and the lack of the church being involved in justice, um, that, that, that is a stumbling block for young people today. And that is something that inhibits the spread of the word of God. And so the 12, the apostles decided that there's a threat to the word of God going and we have to do something about this. And they turned it over just to, to some people to do. Now, um, let's read the next couple of verses. And there's an interesting thing I like to point out from their, their solution here too. So Acts 6, verses 5 and 6. This proposal pleased the whole group. So if you recall, they said, choose seven men full of the spirit and wisdom. We'll turn the responsibility over to them. The proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also, Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. And so they saw a problem and they said, let's, let's get some people to take care of this problem. Now what we don't notice because we, um, these are all strange names to us, right? Like none of us have, well I guess some of us, we do have someone named Stephen here and we have someone named Nicholas here maybe. Right? So we have, we have a couple of them. Yeah, so we have a couple of these. But the rest of them, they're strange names, right? They don't sound familiar to us at all. Uh, what we miss is, what we miss is, uh, usually you can listen to names and tell where people are from based on what their name is. So let me, let me retell this story with a little bit of a twist to it. So let's just say that there are Spanish-speaking Jews. Let's just say, you know, no one's speaking, uh, I don't think they're speaking Spanish back there. There are Spanish-speaking Jews and Hebraic Jews. And the Spanish-speaking Jews came and said, we, we are um, we're being mistreated. You are not treating our widows in the, uh, like, uh, fairly compared to everybody else. And the apostles said, okay, pick seven people to take care of this problem. And they picked Jose, Carlos, Juan, Miguel, Javier, Alejandro, and Cesar. All seven names were Greek names. Not a one of them was an Aramaic Hebrew name. So uh, they, they, t- they not only listened to the complaint, but they gave the authority and the power to the complaining group to solve the problem. Now, I've been in lots of organizations, and I'll tell you what we usually do when someone complains of a uh, racial problem. We usually form a committee or a task force. The task force works for months uh, to produce a document of recommendations that get shelved for consideration by the people in charge when we get around to it. Or sometimes we will invite a person to come on, you know, and maybe even join, join the leadership um, on a non-voting advisory capacity. <laughs> or maybe if like we're really into affirmative action, we might say, you know what, we need to have one or two people on our leadership that come from the aggrieved group. This is like crazy what they did here. <laughs> It was, and, and the reason why they did it was because they were n- unwilling for anything to stand in the way of the spread of the word of God. They said, you know what? We are quick to believe that there is a problem. We are quick to find a solution. And we're not going to nitpick about like, hey, what happens if 
what happens if we give this whole thing to the Hellenistic Jews? Does that mean afterwards the Hebraic Jews are going to be overlooked, right? Wouldn't that be the obvious thing that you'd say that's the danger? Is that, well, what, what, if you give it over to the, the, all of the Hellenistic Jews, then what, what happens in a few months from now? Are the Hebraic Jews going to get overlooked as well? And I don't know, maybe that happened, but they were mostly concerned about the spread of God's word, and they did this. Um, interestingly, like if you hear some of the stories that come, that, that, uh, that come after this, the story of Stephen that, uh, uh, that J- uh, Jake preached about, the story of um, uh, Philip uh, and the Ethiopian who, uh, who, pre- who you Jake preached, I think Jake might have preached on both of those. Um, and they, uh, the, they came from this first group of people that they chose and gave leadership to. So the story ends with Acts chapter 6 verse 7. Again, this, uh, the phrase, the word of God comes back again. It says, so the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. So it started off with a threat to the spread of the word of God and it ended because the, 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 the apostles were willing to do justice. It ended up with the spread of the word of God. And it even says a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Up till now, we hadn't heard about priests becoming Believe followers of Jesus. Because remember, the priests were the ones that were the most against Jesus. A lot of them were involved in in the crucifixion of Jesus. And and somehow, through what happened here, the gospel not only continued to spread, but spread even to some places like the, like, uh, priests. And I don't know wh- where, whether there was something about this that got the attention of the priests, that even the skeptical people started to realize, wait, there's something different about that group. Like, they're doing stuff crazy. Like, nobody does that stuff. And they, it got their attention, perhaps. And they finally said, maybe that's something I should check out. And the result is the word of God spreading. You know, um, when I was a uh, um, when I do campus ministry, a lot of times, some, some of our, our InterVarsity student groups are ones that, you know, wrestle with uh, justice just like everybody else and don't know what to do about it. But then there's some of them that are, um, that are much more proactive. And uh, there was a story one time uh, of, of, uh, a, in, at Sandy, in San Diego where um, we reached out to the most radical Latino activist student organization. Mostly people who'd given up their, their any, any uh, hope of faith, and they, they weren't really any interested at all. But we built a relationship with them, and we even began, began to go with them to protest and things like that. Well, uh, that we got a door open to be able to study the Bible with them. And when they studied the Bible and they saw Jesus turning over the table, there's a story of Jesus going into the temple and turning over the table and saying, you've, you've made my, uh, my, uh, my father's house into a house of robbers. They, they, they saw Jesus doing a protest. And, 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 and you know, I, one of the guys that was a non-Christian in there in the middle of the Bible study stood to his feet and said, Jesus, Jesus, is, a, like he said, Jesus is a revolutionary bad boy. He didn't say boy. Um, and, and these people started coming, they, these, these people started coming to faith. Now, if those of you who remember, I, may, I, I told some stories about InterVarsity the last time I preached, and I mentioned that we are almost always getting kicked off campus somewhere because we require our leaders to be Christians, and then the administration says you can't be Christians. Uh, you know, you can't require, because it's discriminatory if you require Christian groups to have Christian leaders, so you can't meet on campus anymore. So on that, on that campus, we were kicked off of campus for 45 minutes. Because 45 minutes after they made the announcement that they were going to kick us off, there was a knock on the door of the administration from the Latino activist group that said, hey, you mess with InterVarsity, you mess with us. Um, and they did not want to make the Latino activist group angry, and so we were not kicked off campus after 45 minutes. And the word of God spread. You see, so do, doing justice isn't just a fad. It isn't just what all, everybody, if all of your friends are posting something on Facebook, you have to say the same thing that they say. Um, it's not just that. It is a matter of the word of God spreading. You know, a lot of times people will say, well, Christians, they just talk about heaven and God, and they don't really care about this world so much. They, they check out of the problems of this world. Um, and, and that's not something that helps the word of God spread. On the contrary, what helps the word of God spread is, is, is if Christians show that we care about the pains of this world as every bit as much as people who aren't Christians. So I'm going to have just two applications for us, um, and they're very specific. 
Um, and neither of them may be uh, sounds that spiritual. N next week I'll be speaking again and maybe I'll have more spiritual applications. So the first application I have for us, I want to invite all of you, and especially those of you who are watching uh, Church at Home, really glad that you're here. Um, I would like to invite you uh, to influence what you want me to talk about next week. So especially if you're on, on uh, our Facebook Live at home, put something in the comment section about what do you want to hear about next week? Like what questions about the Bible and racial justice are the things that you want to hear about? No, I'm not asking, like, I know that the comment section of Facebook is not usually where we are at our best selves. So I'm not asking for us to sort of like let it all hang out like some of us do on, on co the comment section. But just to say, this is what I'd like to hear about. This is a question I have. What does the Bible say about this? And put that there. Those of you who are here, feel free to go back and put that online. Or I don't care if you get your phone out right now and type it in. Um, what do you want to hear about next week? I'd love to be able to engage with where we are and what we want to talk about here. The, uh, the second application, I think, is going to be only for some of us. Um, now, I know that some of us may be thinking about what do we th actually think about these problems, about racial justice. Like, what, what are my convictions, actually? Um, for those of you who have some convictions about that, who say, I actually have this, I, I believe there's something wrong, and it doesn't have to be, you don't have to have it all figured out, I don't have it all figured out, but if you said, I actually think there is a problem with racial injustice uh, of some sort, I'm going to invite you to come to a protest with me tonight. So there's been a protest going on at the corner of Redbud and uh, Forest Creek Drive uh, nightly, and the last night is tonight. Um, Kaylee and I just went one time, and this is like, this is like the Disney version of protest. It's like the easiest protest you'll ever see. Like, people are standing six feet apart, they're all wearing masks, everyone's like, like friendly, it's a family friendly, you've got like some older people, you've got people with their kids, someone with their walking their dog, like it's, it's like a, it's like the Round Rock Pflugerville version of protest. Um, but, and you see people holding up signs, and my invitation to you is, if you have any conviction about this, and it doesn't have to be to agree with people, by the way, like, what I worry about with something like this is like, what if, what if I go to this and there are other people that, like, what if I am holding the wrong thing on my sign, or what if I don't agree with everything that everyone's saying or doing there? Um, the truth is, I've never gone to a church where I agree with everything that everyone's saying or doing. So um, I just went there and, and I put something on a sign. Kaylee and I put something on a sign that we felt like this is what we want to say. That's what the sign is for. You'll see some things, things that you see over there. I, I saw some things there that I would be like, yeah, I would never hold a sign with that up. You know, that's fine. You know, it's not my sign. It was their sign. <laughs> and there are also some things, you know, you'll see people with things like register to vote. I was like, good, you know, so... Um, so, so uh, I would invite you, if there's something you can put on a sign, if you, for instance, saw the video of George Floyd and say, I don't know any, I don't care, I don't know about anything else, but I think that man deserves justice because I think that was wrong. Come up with a sign that says, justice for George Floyd. You know, some people are uncomfortable for, for, uh, um, for, uh, for whatever reason with Black Lives Matter as something on a sign because of these somewhat associations, then just say, Black Lives Matter to God. Or, black lives are important. You know, if, that be, if, put some, if, if you're willing to put something of your conviction on a sign, and if you feel comfortable, I think we all need to do what we need to do these days, um, but if you're comfortable in a relatively social distance, outdoor mask wearing uh, gathering of more than 10 people, um, I invite you to, to the corner of Red Bud and Forest Creek Drive. It's very, like I said, it's the Disney version of protests if you ever had one. So I just want to bring us back again to the fact that we're engaging with something in our world that um, people will be talking about COVID, but I also think people will be looking back in this year and talking about what happened. And the truth is the fact that almost everybody looks back at the civil rights era as something that was a good thing. Um, most churches didn't do anything during that time. Most churches during that time just said, well, you know, it's a little mixed. I'm not sure I agree with everything that everyone's doing there. Or maybe we're moving a little too fast, or maybe it's a little too strident. Um, and I think that the, the consequences that has had for the, the witness of the church, I think were damaging back then. And so my invitation, again, not if you're not there, not if, you, not if it isn't a conviction of yours, but if you have a conviction, I'm going to invite you to join me. And then I'd like to invite all of us to come back to, uh, next week and talk about whatever it is you guys tell me that you want to talk about. And if I don't hear anything, I guess I'll just need to pray about it and come up with it without you. But uh, I would very much love to hear what you're interested in hearing about. And uh, let me pray for us. 
God, we thank you for the chance to gather and acknowledge you. Um, Lord, we know that anything that we do as people is powerless um, unless you add your power and your spirit to it. We also acknowledge that social change and protest and laws um, are not enough without you making real change in societies and in people. And we also know that just changing people's opinions um, doesn't, uh, doesn't do enough unless your Holy Spirit changes, makes those opinions and changes of convictions to be things that actually happen in our society. Lord, we thank you to, for a chance to be able to gather uh, as a family that knows and loves each other to deal with a topic that has created um, a lot of friction in society today, but also a lot of hope in society. And Lord, we do have hope. We hope that what comes out of this just as we hope is what comes out of uh, the COVID-19 is, is something that you can redeem, that you can make into something that lifts your name up and that the word of God would spread. Lord, I pray that the word of God would spread through the coronavirus uh, uh, pandemic. Lord, I pray that your word, the word of God would spread through the, these protests about racial injustice. Lord, and whatever challenges that each of us might be facing, some of which in our personal lives, we might be going back to challenges that to us individually might feel just as big as those, um, but nobody else in this room may know about it. Lord, we, we ask that through all those, you would be able to have the word, your word of God spread deeper into our own hearts, further uh, in, in this world. We thank you for this chance to be able to acknowledge and worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for coming, everyone. Um, we are asking us to, are we asking people to help with the chairs on the way out or not? No. Okay, so we are asking people to say a quick, friendly hello to each other, but not to congregate for large periods of time. Again, to be able to honor the recommendations uh, from, uh, from the, the, the state about the best way to gather. Um, but it's great to see everybody. I hope we'll be able to say a quick hello, and I look forward to seeing everybody back here next week.